and this is a co copy of the sermon that will be preached at North Shields Evangelical Church um, on Sunday the 23rd of July and before listening it, to it if you could please read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9 of which there's a link below this video going to be looking at four points which should be listed under this video no longer a soul no longer needing sympathy no longer a servant and no longer a statistic so firstly no longer a soul if you filled out a form recently you'll have no doubt come across the new box the box labeled prefer not to say ethnicity white british asian or prefer not to say sexuality straight gay prefer not to say religion christian muslim prefer not to say employment status non gangster prefer not to say As a white British male, I totally understand why someone would want to select all of the prefer not to say boxes. For every single one of those words is very loaded. White British male. Male chauvinism, male dominance, male misogyny. You know, I don't want to be associated with any of those things. White British male white supremacy, white saviour, white privilege. Again, the word white comes with a lot of negative baggage. White British male. British colonialism, English hooligans, and the vilest, most repulsive, repulsive of them all, English mustard. Please, please don't associate with me with any of these things. Mephibosheth probably wished he lived the, lived in the days of the prefer not to say box. For Mephibosheth would have had, had to start every form with his name. Name Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul. You know, the death of King Saul was branded good news by most in Israel. Immediately after Saul's death, Saul's eldest son had been hunted down and stabbed. The Gibeonites, a group of people, had put wanted posters all over, demanding all Saul's surviving relatives be hanged. You know, in other words, it wasn't a good time to be associated with King Saul. And yet, in verse 1, Meshephibosheth receives a message. King David is asking to see the surviving relatives of King Saul. What is your name? Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul, or prefer not to say. But why does what follows in verse 1 actually matter? Well, imagine you're applying for a job, maybe as a volunteer or, as a, or for a paid position. Let's just fill out the form together. How do you deal with stress at work? Count to ten, eat ten bags of Maltesers, or prefer not to say. What goes through your head when dealing with difficult customers? Prefer not to say, prefer not to say, or prefer not to say. Can we ask your last boss for a reference? Only if you dig him up from my back garden, or prefer not to say. Let's keep filling out the form. How many times did you lie during the last working week? Would you describe integrity as one of your strengths? What really goes on behind closed doors? You know, don't give us all the fake stuff that you make up to tell at interviews. If you honestly told us who you truly are, what really motivates you, what, you really, what really goes on in your head, would we still want to employ you? Mephibosheth didn't want to be associated with King Saul. 
sometimes the person we most not don't want to be sometimes the person that we most sometimes the person we don't want to be associated with is ourselves you know we spend our lives preferring not to say stuff about ourselves hiding from the many truths about us that we do not want other people to see and the scary message of the Bible is and the scary message of the Bible is this God sees all and he wants to arrange a meeting now do you see why the second half of verse 1 matters so much Saul was David's enemy the one who's caused David massive harm and David asked is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake David David chooses to treat Mephibosheth not as an enemy, but as a friend. David chooses to treat him not according to the sins of his grandfather, Saul, but according to the righteousness of another, Jonathan. If you've read earlier on in the story, you'll learn that Jonathan, Saul's son, had lived a righteous life, had showed loyalty to David, and he had asked David to show kindness to his children, Mephibosheth being his child. And when you are Mephibosheth, grandson of Saul, this is very good news. The king is not going to treat you according to the sins of Saul, but is going to treat you according to the righteousness of someone else. The central hope of Christianity is the same. For those who believe the gospel, the central message about Jesus, for those who believe the gospel, God the King has chosen not to treat you according to your sins. All the times you've buried God in the back garden, all the times you've done things you'd prefer not to say, God is not going to treat you according to this list. God is going to treat you according to the righteousness of someone else. This person is Jesus, in case you hadn't guessed. And this is good news. This is good news. This, this good news is so freeing if you have things in your past that you'd rather not be associated with. God is not going to treat you according to this list, but he's going to treat you according to the righteousness of someone else. This good news frees us to confess the worst about ourselves openly rather than hiding behind the words I prefer not to say. It's what Jesus has done, not what you have done. It's the, that is the main factor in how God sees you and treats you. This is good news. And this good news also, it also frees us from the need to play the victim card. Which brings us to no longer needing sympathy. Now, Mephibosheth would have made a good poster child for any charity. He was dropped by mistake at age five, five causing, him to, causing him to be crippled in both legs. And his parents called him shame. Mephibosheth means shame. Both Mephibosheth's appearance and his name invoked a certain sympathy. But this wasn't the factor that caused David to show kindness to him. Verse 2. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned to him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Now why does verse 2 point out Ziba's name twice? Well, because, like David, we're meeting Ziba for the first time. David did not know Ziba, that is, disabled Mephibosheth's carer. David didn't know Mephibosheth. In other words, David did not show Mephibosheth kindness for Mephibosheth's sake. David didn't show Mephibosheth kindness because he knew he'd had a hard upbringing and was a victim. 
David showed Mephibosheth kindness for Jonathan's sake. But what does that mean? Why is that good? Well, so often when I sin, I, I turn myself into a poster child of some charity. I play the victim card. I'm a victim of bad, a bad upbringing or the pressure of bad circumstances. Look at my list of excuses and show some kindness. I deserve sympathy, some slack, certainly not condemnation. You know, Mephibosheth, he might have had some right to play the victim card. But we don't. We sin by choice. We make decisions because our values are already corrupt. And yet we tire ourselves out, trying to convince ourselves and others of something different. You know, if I sinned right now, you know, I'd be going around everybody in my church congregation with my list of excuses. I'd be phoning them up all week, trying to convince them that I'm good and not bad. You know, trying to convince people that you're better than you are is tiring. But the good news of the gospel is that you don't need to convince God that you're better than you are. You don't need to, con to play the sympathy card. You don't need to ask God to cut you a little slack. You know, God's kindness towards you has nothing to do with the best or worst about you. You know, God, like Jesus, shows us kindness because of the perfect righteousness of someone else. That being Jesus, his son. As it says in the book of Titus, But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, through Jesus Christ our Saviour. No longer a soul, no longer a need, to pl a need for sympathy, and no longer a servant. You know, when it comes to a job application, someone disabled might tick the prefer not to say box. They might prefer not to say that they are disabled because they don't want to be looked down on or because they don't feel they need the extra help or because they don't want to be picked for the job purely to help the company's equality and diversity statistics. Someone might hide their disability at an interview. But when Mephibosheth met David, he could not. We read in verse 3 that Zebat answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had brought him from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. David had to literally bring Mephibosheth to him. Mephibosheth had to be lifted up onto a donkey, carried all the way to the palace, and helped down like a little child. You know, Mephibosheth could not hide his neediness from David. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him on it. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. At your service, service, Mephibosheth replied. You know, David had hundreds of servants. David was a strong gladiator of a man. What could Mephibosheth offer him? You know, Mephibosheth came to David with nothing to offer except his need. Mephibosheth needed David to do everything for him. Now don't get me wrong, chapter 9 is not a picture of the place of disabled people in society. Nowadays, through a few workplace ab adaptations, those with physical impairments can make a very valued contribution to any organisation. Chapter 9 is not a picture of the place of disabled people in society. Chapter 9 is meant as a picture of the Gospel. We come to God with nothing except our need. 
God had to bring us to himself. We were wandering away from God until God decided to bring us back. We were so blind we couldn't see the truth without God opening our eyes. We came with nothing, no goodness of our own, and we're dependent on Jesus to do everything to make us right with God. Now, of course, we prefer not to say. We don't like to admit these things. We were blind, but we didn't need to be born again. We simply thought again, and then the gospel made sense. We were wandering away a little, but a few small adjustments, and we became the morally virtuous person that we are today. We heroic Christians spend our lives at God's service, proving to ourselves and the world that we are such a good people after all. God should be glad to have us serving him. But this is a wrong view of the gospel. You know, we don't come to God as servants with something to offer. We don't come to God needing to earn his favour each new day. We don't come to God as servants, as verse 7 makes abundantly clear. David said to Mephibosheth, At your service, he replied. Sorry, David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. You know, Mephibosheth is not the servant of David. David makes himself the servant of Mephibosheth. David does everything for Mephibosheth for the price of nothing. David puts food on his table for the rest of his life. David exalts Mephibosheth to the status of a king. If you're a Christian this morning, are you willing to admit that Jesus did the same for you? Giving us everything for nothing eternally put in God's favour, making us not servants who must earn our salvation, but children who are loved for free. Or put it another way, can you come to God with nothing? Or does that humble you too much? Does your self-esteem wages vary on depending on how many hours you put in at God's office? Or would you, could you be as certain of God's favour even if you sat on the sofa for the next 12 months. Where well, there's one sense that a Christian is a servant, there's a definite sense that we are not. We don't come to God with anything to offer. We don't earn our God's grace by the good that we do. Because of Jesus, we are not servants. And because of Jesus, we are no longer a statistic either. You might wonder, why did David do all this for Mephibosheth? You know, was it to improve David's equality and diversity statistics? Well, what we learn in verse 9 and 10 is that no one is a statistic as far as God is concerned. Verse 9, Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. You know, if David was merely concerned with statistics, verse 10 would stop here. One le less person was going to bed hungry. One disabled person was on the palace's books. Job done. But Mephibosheth, was not just a servant, a statistic on David's books. Mephibosheth was a somebody, an individual for whom David really cared. David said, you are to do all this so that your master's grandson may be provided for, and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. David wanted to bring Mephibosheth into a relationship with himself. And the good news of the gospel is that God, through Jesus, wants to do the same for you. 
in the book of John it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. What are you if you are a believer in Jesus? Not a statistic, one more number added on to the book of heaven. You're a, you and I are a children of God. People that God cares for. Someone God individually loves. As it says in the book of Peter, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That is the good news of Jesus Christ.